Welcome back to the machine learning and data science track. Next up, we have Shyan, who will be speaking to us about EEL SpecNet. Over to you, Shyan. Thank you so much. So I will uh, share my screen now, and uh, I will begin from the slides. So I assume that you can see my slides right now. I assume yes. So uh, the project that I'm working on, first of all, yes, my name is Cheyenne, and uh, I'm coming from McMaster University Canadian Center for Electron Microscopy. So I'm technically a microscopist, a physicist, trying to improve the current status of the field using Python. Uh, and um, no professional programmer, so do not expect uh, crazy things in the programming side. Uh, and today I'm going to introduce uh, ILS PECnet, our deep learning solution for uh, ILS spectral uh, deconvolution. In my talk, uh, I will uh, have four sections. I will start with introduction, introducing a little bit about the technique that uh, we use, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, aka ILS. And uh, then I will introduce the problems that we have uh, with the signal and introduce our project objective, and then I will go talk more about the network that we use uh, to solve these problems. So the technique that we use, as I mentioned, is electron energy loss spectroscopy. So it is conducted inside a scanning transmission electron microscope. I don't go uh, to the details, but schematically, we have a column and we have an electron beam uh, electron gone, uh, sorry, forming an electron beam for us, and beam interacts with the sample that we have inside the column in a pixel by pixel manner. Then signal leaves the sample, and at each pixel, we obtain a spectrum. The spectrum uh, is something like this. This data is coming from an experimentally obtained data. Here you can see we have a silver bow tie as a uh, nano antenna, and uh, the spectra that you can see here is coming from the pixel showing by this uh, red box. Um, all of the spectral analysis in this work is uh, being done using uh, hyperspy software in Jupyter, and uh, the huge peak that you see here at the center is called the uh, zero loss peak. This peak represents uh, those electrons that just pass through the sample without any or very minor inelastic interactions uh, with the sample. The intensity, as you can see, is uh, so high for these peaks. So most of the peaks that are passing uh, through the sample are not actually uh, conveying any uh, physical uh, definition regarding the properties uh, that we are looking at. but Around uh, this area are those electrons that are actually losing some energy and convey some meaningful uh, information for us. So, but as you can see, the count in this area is below 200 counts. What we get from the zero loss peak is 40,000 uh, counts. So, the data that we get is uh, noisy and the physical interpretations are buried under the tail of the zero loss for us. This area is very important for those who work uh, in the field of photonics, plasmonics, and phononics. If you have any questions about a specific uh, physical meaning of these fields, we can discuss it after the talk. But um, the problem is that uh, the data is very difficult to extract. And for visualization, during my uh, presentation, I use these dispersive maps that you can see here um, to show the zero loss peak and uh, the features at the same time. Otherwise, I need to always have the zero loss peak and then uh, have another window uh, magnifying the region of interest. But Using these maps, these heat maps from Maplot, we easily draw the thing. 
So as I was mentioning, uh, there are features that are not uh, easily uh, visible in our signal. For example, uh, if, for example, we average over the pixels that we have in this area, in this area, we see these collective behaviors, these coherent behaviors in uh, the sample itself, which are actually enhanced electromagnetic fields uh, that we are looking for, and they're very important for us. They can have application in cancer therapy, in optoelectronics or photonics or other fields. But the spectra itself is not uh, easily showing this information to us. The reason for this is, of course, convolution that exists in almost all the optical systems, and uh, which means that if you have an object like this, the reality to watch, and your system has a probe or some uh, machine-related uh, parameters that observes generally in this manner, uh, like a point spread function looking like this, what you will get as the image as an output will uh, be looked like this. Of course, if your system has some electronic parts, the problem might be worse and you have a uh, high frequency noise. The same thing happens in a spectral uh, deconvolution and distortion. So what happens for our uh, ill signal is that if this is the reality that we want on the left, after considering the system having a point spread function, everything will be blurred, everything will be broadened. And on the top of that, the image that system, the digitalization of the system, the CCD and the computers just give us or something like this. And one uh, important thing, we cannot throw out the data. The instrumentation that we are using is very expensive. The machine, the microscope is in the range of $10 million or so. And for kind of making it running, and it needs a facility of the same price to be built uh, to make this running. So whatever we get, it is expensive, and we need to extract the data with whatever that we have. So the mathematical uh, definition of this distortion can uh, be written like this. I mean, we have a convolution uh, operation plus some high frequency noise, but in electron optics, we have another, uh, how to say it, extra problem. We have a cherry on top. And it is just the fact that the beam is shaking, the electron beam uh, during time is shaking. So when we are capturing an image, of course we have a dwell time. And uh, with the dwell time that we have, uh, what happens is that the feature, the spectra that we are observing are moving sideways on uh, the CCD detector. So at the end, what happens is that we have a dwell time the beam is shaking, the beam is jumping on the CCD. So CCD at time, for example, T0 sees something like the yellow spectra at time T1 sees something like a T1 detector and uh, at time T2, another spectra. Uh, and at the end, what it does is that, okay, uh, it says, let's average over them and consider this as the reality then it convolutes it for us with its point spread function, and then it is sprinkled some high frequency noise on the top. The thing is that if we use conventional uh, deconvolution methods, what happens is that if they work perfectly, they eliminate the high frequency noise, they eliminate the point spread function, but the reality we observe is the averaged reality of the things that our beam is observing. So our goal is to reconstruct the original uh, signal that has physical meaning and it is not uh, average over the time because of the shaking that our electron beam has. Currently techniques that are used for doing this are uh, Fourier-based, deconvolution techniques and uh, Bayesian-based uh, deconvolution techniques. Uh, these two actually are the most used uh, techniques currently in the field. 
Uh, the Fourier based techniques, unfortunately, are not uh, very sensitive to the high frequency noise. And for a data as noisy as uh, ours, it is uh, better to use something that is uh, more sensitive to noise. So usually Bayesian statistics, Bayesian uh, based methods are the method that is used for the convolution. In here, we use uh, Richardson Lucy. Uh, to compare the data we obtained from ill specnet and uh, see how uh, ill specnet performed with respect to the method that is currently used in the community. For applying uh, the technique for applying Richardson Lucid convolution, we again use a HyperSpy Python toolbox. And uh, you can see it is very simple. It is one line of code, and you can implement that. Okay, so let's dive into our solution. So what we do uh, is to use an architecture, a deep learning architecture, to take the output image and construct the objective, the, the, the actually, sorry, or construct the reality uh, using this network. The network has a U-shaped uh, convolutional neural network, it is heavily inspired by UNET. And uh, what it does instead of segmentation or classification is that it gets 1D signal, one dimensional signal, and it reconstructs the physical reality. For doing that, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, we have an encoding path and decoding path. Uh, the encoding path extract the features, decoding path the construct the near reality based on the features that we have extract, extracted. And in order to help the learning process and keep the construction related to the actual experimental reality, we intentionally leak information, we merge the uh, data in the encoder with the data in the decoder path at each level. Uh, the code can be found uh, in this GitHub repository. Uh, it, it is not public at the moment. It will be public uh, within a few weeks. And uh, the codes are written in the TensorFlow and Colab and Jupyter Notebook. So this is, a, uh, this is an example of the convolutional layer, the, 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 the convolutional neural uh, kernel that we use between layer one and two. So what happens is that, for example, from layer one of the uh, encoding path to layer two of the encoding path, uh, we use a convolutional neural network to extract features. The convolutional kernel that we use uh, in the first layer has 64 uh, channels in the feature channel, and it has uh, four uh, indexes in the uh, energy channel space. And by jumping with a stride of two, it kind of shrinks the space, the energy channel space by a factor of two at each step. And it just expands the feature channel based on the dimension that it has. Uh, using uh, the TensorFlow API, you can easily do that. Uh, you can easily define each layer, and uh, which is what we did. And for decoder path, we just used the uh, transposed um, tensor for the CNN kernel. Um, Il SpecNet provides you uh, with ability just to uh, compile your own training data. I mean, this is based on uh, TensorFlow. API, of course, you can uh, train your desired uh, training set, or you can uh, use already trained uh, data sets that we have uploaded uh, for ill specnet. For um, already trained data sets, we have a strategy that has uh, uh, four steps. So the training data are uh, actually made for our application, which is uh, doing ills um, with a very different uh, high frequency noise modulations and different broadening of the peak. Uh, and for that, what we do is that at the first step, we assume that uh, 
our beam, our electron beam is a perfect beam, is a quasi Dirac function. The reason that I call it quasi is that uh, instead of one energy channel, we consider three energy channels for it. And uh, we assume that we observe a physical concept, physical uh, phenomena uh, with this Dirac function. And uh, we make a spectrum that is not broadened because of the broadening of the peak. The next step will be simulating impact of dual time, as I mentioned, those uh, shakes and those movements. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, at the end, uh, we just uh, apply different uh, OTF functions, or optical transfer functions, or point spread functions uh, to the system and convolute the uh, signal and uh, add different high frequency noise to it. So this is an example of uh, what we get after the first step of uh, making the training set. As you can see, we have this Dirac function that has three channels, and we assume a Gaussian uh, uh, distribution for it. And then uh, we add our physical concepts, physical peaks that are representing a physical concept here are Laurentian peaks coming from surface plasmon peaks into it, and this becomes our original reality. In the next step, we shake the whole peak to the sides, and we just add all this spectra together to, be, to kind of simulate the impact of dual time. And uh, then we convolute the signal with, uh, com the, with a point spread function we assume. So as you can see from the Dirac function zero loss peak to the convoluted one, we lose uh, a lot of uh, counts and the signal becomes broadened, uh, which the reason is that these things are technically probability functions. So a probability function should has uh, the integral of one under the curve. And when we broaden the signal, the height of the zero loss peak regardingly, regardingly just uh, reduces. And uh, we get from this, the original data after convolution to the convoluted reality, uh, which is broadened. And then as the last step, we add the high frequency noise. And as you can see, after doing this, procedures, some of our peaks that are really close to the zero loss peak may uh, be buried under the tail and be hidden, and some of them may be just um, become broader. Okay, um, let's go to the results that we obtained from Eel Specknet and the comparison of the data with the Richardson Lucy. Uh, the Eel Specknet uh, network uh, is trained uh, using uh, 6,000 data that uh, we actually generated uh, using the function that we have made. Uh, this function can be found in uh, this address. It is uh, written in the Jupyter, and we just give it number of the peaks and, uh, sorry, number of the spectra that we want and some specifications about the spectra and it just generates those uh, spectra, the data set for you. Um, the things, the parameters that are randomly uh, uh, located or determined on each spectra are uh, the location of surface plasma peaks, those tiny peaks, uh, but they should actually happen after the zero loss peak. Uh, the number of the peaks, uh, the training data set that I have used here is uh, limited to maximum of five peaks. And then it is level of high frequency, noise, and dwell time, and number of jumps that all of them, of course, have a maximum that uh, I have set. But about the fixed parameters, the length of all the spectra that we are simulating is uh, uh, 2048, and that's because our CCD camera 
has exactly 20, uh, 48 channels, and we cannot have a data with more than this amount of channel. So next step was to train the network with the convoluted data and then uh, applied on a, on a spectra. The spectra that we have selected is the one that I showed you how we made it, is uh, the spectra with two peaks. One peak is hidden under the zero loss peak tail, as you can see uh, in the convoluted data, and one peak is broadened. After applying uh, Richardson Lucy and ILSPEC net, what we observed uh, with respect to Richardson Lucy was that it is great. It can locate the peaks, but uh, of course, it first of all uh, only reduces the ZLP tail, and it doesn't remove the ZLP tail. And of course, as uh, those who work with Richardson Lucy know, it introduces a lot of artifacts, a lot of no high frequency noise into the data. These artifacts can be seen in the green box at the end of the uh, spectrum, and even uh, here within the spectrum as a high frequency noise. But on the other hand, the response that we got from ILSPECnet was excellent. It definitely removes the zero loss peak, uh, sorry, sorry, zero loss tail. It definitely better locates the peaks inside the spectrum. And the reality that it shows is closer to the original reality. This can be seen better in the energy dispersive maps. So once more, these maps are just representing the heat maps of uh, the energy channels. And in the vertical direction, they don't have dimension. They are just stretched in this dimension. And what you can see from uh, convoluted data to ILSPECnet has a big difference uh, with Richards and Lucy's performance. Definitely the autoencoder or architecture in the ILSPECnet removes the high frequency noise or damps the high frequency noise. And uh, the peaks are closer to what we actually uh, know as the original reality of the signal we provided. And this is the impact of deep learning uh, in our microscopy society because uh, technically these instruments are extremely expensive and very difficult to change. So this is uh, the best to just use the signal that we have and extract as much as we can. ILSPECnet as a deep learning network, of course, is not limited to tra being trained by one training data set. And uh, you can train the ILSPECnet with different data sets. For instance, here we trained ILSPECnet with uh, different data sets with uh, a data set that only extract the plasma properties, plasmonic properties only extract the signal and doesn't uh, have anything to do with the zero loss peak. It completely removes the tail and the peak uh, itself and uh, just gives us the physical uh, reality. Uh, but of course, we still uh, need to work on uh, these aspects and tune some parameters for applications other than uh, the convolution. But uh, the thing that should be uh, mentioned uh, when we say deep learning is working great is that uh, there, we should be very careful with uh, deep learning because training is very important. If you under train a network, uh, the network of course is not gonna work. Here we compared the uh, uh, Richards and Lucy and ILSPECnet again with each other, but this time uh, we actually uh, trained the network with a training set that was uh, more simplified, and we offered the network to predict in a spectrum that is more complicated, which means both in the noise range and uh, in the number of peaks, 
it was more complicated than what network was already trained with. And the results was uh, totally better for the Richards and Lucy. So, of course, you still have uh, Richards and Lucy artifacts. You cannot do anything about them. But uh, if you use under-trained network, as you see in the lion curve here, the LSPEC net cannot uh, perfectly fit the data. It gets even worse uh, when your noise is also in a high uh, level. But the thing is that when your noise is in a high level, your ill, your uh, Richards and Lucy also is not working. So it is better that if you have a very noisy data, uh, use ill-spec.net, but make sure that uh, you train it with a proper data set. In this regard, uh, of course, after training the data set, you need to do some hyperparameter tuning for improve the performance of the system. And uh, one example that we considered uh, for our network for ILSPECnet was uh, the depth of the network. So if someone was using the ILSPECnet model, what can be done to see which uh, model is better for the performance and also the runtime is to uh, try different uh, depth for the models. So ILSPECnet has a, a three-dimensional, five-dimensional, seven-dimensional, and 10-dimensional networks. And what I mean from three dimension is uh, the number of layers in uh, the encoding path, which also is replicated in the decoding path. So which means we have three layers in the three convolutional uh, layers in the encoder and three convolutional layers uh, in the decoder and so on. The same thing for other dimens dimensionality of the model. Uh, of course, by making a deeper model, if you require uh, finer features, you can achieve uh, better results. But the training rate is going to be slower and uh, the training is going to be more time consuming. For example, for 1000 epochs, our 10D model takes 16 hours to be trained on uh, 6000 data, while uh, our 3D model takes 20 minutes or so. So it is always uh, a threshold to balance what is more important. So, in the conclusion, I can say that uh, we actually uh, presented ILSPECnet uh, model as a deep learning architecture and uh, Python script for spectral reconstruction purposes. Uh, the performance that we get uh, from ILSPECnet in a properly trained data set was excellent and uh, currently existing methods are not uh, working in the same level of accuracy. Uh, and of course, the autoencoder nature of the architecture uh, is uh, working very good for the noise reduction, even uh, in the uh, situation and conditions that the fitting is not happening properly. Our future stream is uh, to use the experimental data itself to train the network. So currently, we use uh, simulated data, but it is better to use the image that is captured in a specific condition and generate new uh, training set based on the uh, image that is captured, train the network, and then uh, restore the signal um, using the trained network that is trained with the related data. The reason that I say that is that in so many cases, um, especially in the field of electron microscopy, microscope is highly sensitive to the environmental situation. For example, if you have a, have a storm, there is a huge electromagnetic wave uh, in this space. And it doesn't matter how expensive your facility is or microscope is located inside the box that is protected, you always get 
very awkward noises that are related to the weather condition. And the, it is not easy to simulate that. You can simulate a very huge data set and consider all those things, but it is anyway better to uh, do the use the existing data. Anyway, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and uh, that was my thought. I guess I am over time. I'm so sorry about that. That's OK, only just barely. Uh, we have maybe time for one question. Uh, if, if anybody has a specific question that, that really like answered, please drop it in the Q&A. Um, well, given we're, we're short on time, I'll just ask very quickly. Uh, these are some very impressive results. Um, is deep learning widely used in microscopy yet? And uh, given results like these, do you, if it's not, do you foresee a lot wider uptake of these sorts of, of techniques? Of course. Okay. I mean, two years ago, uh, our group was using deep learning only to find the peaks, manganese oxidation peaks, 3 plus, 4 plus, and it was really simple application. But as we move forward, now we are considering using uh, deep learning to reconstruct reality, to connect simulations to the results and vice versa. For example, get a uh, spectrum and then go say what shape or what system these uh, spectra were connecting to that. So yeah, the, the, as we move forward, the application is growing drastically. All right, well, let's all thank Cheyenne again for a great talk. And, thank uh, you so much. Thank you for joining the session, everyone.